In one of its rarest forms, 17 Blocks is a unique documentary that takes place over the span of almost 20 years. It follows the Sanford family as they deal with loss, trauma, and poverty. Starting the documentary off in 1999, the filmmaker Davey Rothbart met Emmanuel and his brother Smurth while playing basketball as little kids. As time went on and their friendship began to develop, Davey began filming the family. When he started to film less and less, Emmanuel, Smurth, and other family members picked up the camera themselves. Filming for over 20 years and having over 1,000 hours of footage, they were able to create a profound documentary that was just released in 2019. Titled 17 Blocks to represent how close they are to the capital in D.C., this documentary highlights issues such as drug use and violence taking place right in D.C.'s backyard. To really understand the family story, we have to start from the beginning. The matriarch of the family, Cheryl, grew up in a middle working class family, attending private elite middle and high schools. Dreaming of being a movie star, Cheryl admits that her life didn't pan out the way that she hoped. She admitted that being a parent was harder than she expected because she was a single mother and that's something she wasn't used to because she grew up in a two-parent household. Their father died when they were young and Smurf even admits that it was so long ago that he's not even sad about it. As the documentary goes on, Cheryl introduces her boyfriend Joe and explains the life that they want to live with each other. Even though their original intentions were pure, we quickly see a change at the 16 minute mark. Joe explains that he wants better for Cheryl but admits that he does abuse drugs and alcohol as well. The saddest part about these moments is the kids' perceptions of them. Emmanuel expresses how he thinks drugs are bad and that it makes you a failure. Cheryl's daughter Denise is even seen casually talking to her friends on the phone while their mom is passed out behind her. At this point, they're so desensitized and used to seeing their mother like this that it becomes their norm. Even when Cheryl is arguing with Joe, Emmanuel is seen casually laying on his bed, minding his own business. He doesn't look phased at all. Throughout the documentary, Joe is seen contradicting himself. One moment he's explaining how they're not living right and that he wants to set a better example for the kids. And then in the next scene, they're driving to their dealer. When Emmanuel is introduced, he's shown as this sweet and goofy child who is smart and kind. When he does his private confessionals, he always talks about the life he wants and what his future is going to look like. Seeing how all the violence, drug abuse, and crime was affecting Emmanuel was hard to watch. He sees these things at home while he's hanging out with his brother and even on the news. Watching him try to process what he sees on a daily basis shows how much of a weight this life is already putting on him. The oldest brother, Smurf, was first introduced as the only one who wasn't in school. Starting this documentary off at the age of 15, he is seen hanging out and smoking with his friends. Smurf's story was one of the saddest to me. Being the oldest, he has seen more of the life his mother lives for the longest amount of time at least compared to his siblings. I can imagine that if you're exposed to something long enough, sooner or later it can consume you. It's clear that he is a drug dealer because in one scene they find a man who owes him money and they brutally jump him in the middle of the street. When the documentary jumps 10 years to 2009, the family moved to a more quieter and peaceful neighborhood. Cheryl has been sober for three months and admits that she's still struggling with her addiction. Emmanuel has just graduated high school and he dreams of becoming a firefighter. He is now in a relationship with a girl named Carmen, who the family loves and is close to. Even as an adult, Emmanuel is the opposite of his brother. He just likes to go to work, hang out with his girlfriend, and then go home. He doesn't drink or do drugs, and it seems like he's the first in his family to graduate high school. Now, Smurf is 24 and has two kids. After being locked up for over a year, he explained how he wanted to stop selling drugs, but he admitted that as soon as he got back out, he went right back to selling. Now, this is when the documentary takes an even sadder turn. When two dudes forced themselves into their house because they were trying to rob Smurf, Emmanuel tried to fight back, and in the process, he got killed. This is the last time. Not long after Carmen Payne hung up the phone with her fiance, 19 year old Emmanuel Durant, police say he was murdered by two masked men who they believe were trying to rob his family inside their home on Webster Street. Even though Smurf is clearly heartbroken about his brother's death, he struggles to come to terms with his role in the situation. How the mother feels towards Smurf feels very similar to how Brenda felt towards Doughboy when Ricky died in Boys in the Hood. What's irritating is watching the mom only put the blame on Smurf when Smurf never stood a chance or was given the guidance to live his life any other way. Don't get me wrong, I think he played a part in it, but so did Cheryl. 
When we jump to 2016, it was explained that Emmanuel's case is now classified as a cold case. Denise, the sister, even discusses how the violence in DC is only getting worse each year. Smurf is still dealing drugs and now he's facing up to 30 years in prison. He also has a drug problem now as well. Seeing him lay on the bed, knocked out, is like a full circle moment. Him being in the same place his mother was 20 years ago was sad to see. Cheryl commented on how she doesn't understand why he would want to do drugs and I'm thinking like, girl, what? Towards the end of the movie, it does seem like he wants to get better and he even seems receptive to counseling. He then gets a regular job at the grocery store and he seems content with that choice. For most of the last quarter of the movie, we follow Justin, who was Denise's son, who is now nine years old, the same age Emmanuel was at the start of the documentary. We watch him try to understand the life that's around him and it's so clear to see their similarities. My favorite subjects are math, science, social studies, and reading. My subject is math and reading, English, social studies, PE, this documentary does a good job in showing how these topics can be generational. Sometimes generations make the same negative choices, like Smurf having an addiction like his mom, and sometimes cycles are broken, like how Denise is raising Justin. Denise is seen as an active parent who wants the best for her kids as she puts him in karate to keep Justin busy. When Shira moves in with her daughter Denise, Denise explains how her mom always blames other people for her problems and refuses to take accountability. She even says that Cheryl does powder pretty much every day and it's starting to become too much. Cheryl finally decides to go to rehab and even sort of admits that she played a part in her family's trauma. When she exited rehab, she finally had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Smurf and admitted her wrongdoings in the past. Towards the end of the movie, Cheryl did also open up about a traumatic experience that pushed her towards drug use. I'm not going to explain this story because it's extremely traumatizing, but my heart did break for her and the story she told was unimaginable. I wanted to make a video about this documentary because I feel like it needs more recognition than it's given. I feel like a lot of the times when people hear about drug use and violence, most people reference or imagine a scene from a show or a movie. I think it's rare for a lot of people to have firsthand experience with these types of trauma and that's what makes this documentary so well. Every scene was raw and real and shined a light on issues that people outside of these communities ignore. It shows that drug abuse, poverty, and violence can be generational and it's not so black and white of good people versus bad people. If you would like to watch this documentary, I found it on Paramount Plus. The last thing I want to say is I am going to be trying to post more content, so stay tuned. I put this documentary out because I am working on a larger video that's going to take some time, but you will be seeing it in the next few weeks. It's going to be about roll bounce and house party, so I think you guys are going to love it. I want to say thank you for watching and please like, share, and subscribe. Bye.